Yeah. You want to borrow one? <laughs> Abe Elizabeth, Town Council, uh, regular meeting, August 11th, 1997. Uh, we have a roll call by the town clerk, please. Chairman Groth? Yeah. Council Berry? Yeah. Council Byer? Present. Council Fritz? Here. Council Jordan? Yeah. Council McGinty? Here. And Council Reed? Here. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda? There appear to be none. Reports and correspondence. Any councils? Yes, Chairman Carr. Uh, I'd like to make a quick report for the Jordan Trust Committee. Uh, we met on July 14th, uh, and the committee is composed of uh, members McGinty, Barry, Byer, and Mike also attended. <coughs> of those three, we elected John McGinty as chair, Henry Barry as vice chair, and myself as secretary. We reviewed the guidelines for giving and we reviewed the fact there's a $40,000 maximum that can be given. We then reviewed two specific requests which were approved. The committee met again tonight just before this meeting uh, and we reviewed an additional request which was conditionally approved. And that's our report. Thank you. Are there any other reports or, and or correspondence? Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to briefly uh, remind the Council, inform you, I think you're all aware, but let the public know as well, that Marguerite Hollowell uh, re uh, retired a week ago Friday from the Thomas More Library. She worked there full-time for about 20 years, including her part-time service for over, t for over 29 years. So really a tremendous service uh, to the community. They had a nice party for her. Uh, with the library, some of the patrons was uh, very well attended. And, uh, just she, uh, I know you all joined me in wishing her a very fine retirement. Uh, second, Julie Bell, uh, you may have heard, is leaving the library after a couple of years of service as a young adult librarian, someone who, who really added a lot of uh, zest to the library, and uh, she'll be missed as well. Uh, also, Scott Poulin, our school business manager, municipal comptroller, announced this past week that he's going to the town of Cumberland. Uh, to accept a similar position, and uh, he's been a tremendous help uh, to all of us here in uh, squaring away some of our financial records. And finally, one you prob probably haven't heard about is our sealer of weights and measures, uh, Keith Sherrod, who's been doing that for five or six years, uh, maybe in seven now, uh, is, is, will be leaving us. He was also the sealer for South Portland, and after he saw one gas station going in with 54 separate pumping uh, pumps that you could have, he decided that it was time for someone else to do the job uh, when he saw the growth. So uh, he's resigned. We'll be looking at replacing him. So I wanted to update you on all those personnel changes. Are there any, any other reports and or correspondence? Now time for presentations. Um, I actually get to make one, and this is probably the most fun of this job, especially uh, this particular presentation, because this, is, uh, this concerns the 11 and 12-year-old Little League girls who did a tremendous job this year. And the council has a resolution, has uh, signed a resolution, and I'd like to present it. The manager of the team, Mark Millar, uh, cannot be here tonight, but the two coaches, uh, Tom Getchell and Ellen Knight, are, and I'd ask them to come forward if they would. Come right on in, and I'll tell you what. As I indicated, uh, this is the Little League Girls All-Star team, and uh, 
as many of you know, I've been involved in this program a long time, so it's a real thrill for me to see this. And I guess, Tom, if you'd uh, tell the public about uh, the girls' success this year and then maybe introduce the girls that are here and not here, then we can uh, read the resolution. Thank you, Chairman Groff. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing the girls, and I'd like to start by introducing our 11-year-olds. First of all, this is a team made up. It's what's called the Major League All-Star Team. Majors means the 9, 10, 11, and 12 age group in Little League, what we always used to think of as Little League. And there's a 9 and 10 age group, and then there's an 11 and 12 age group. This is the 11 and 12-year-old age group of All-Stars. We had two 11-year-olds on our team this year. One is here tonight, and one could not be here. Uh, Bryn Curran, would you stand up, please? And the other is Kate Gohegan. Now, I, I'm mentioning them first because at the end of the last game in the Eastern Regional Playoffs down in Delaware, which we lost, there were two runners stranded on base representing the possible winning, excuse me, tying runs. And those two runners were our two 11-year-olds, Bryn Curran and Kate Gohegan. So there are no guarantees about making next year's team, of course, but barring unforeseen circumstances, we're looking for them to pick up where they left off and lead the team to on to the next step next year. Also here tonight are 12 year olds, and this is quite a group of girls, which I'll talk about in a moment. Margie Reed, Diana Getchell, Allie Knight, Kate Martin, and unable to be here tonight, McKinley Donahue, Andrea Skillings, Ashley Barker, Heidi Millar, who's on vacation with her family, including the manager, Mark Millar, Christina Foley, Jen Fowler, Katie Wentworth, and Nikki Tarbox. This team won the state championship for 11 and 12 year old Little Leaguers for the first time that any Cape Elizabeth Little League team has done that in 23 years, boys or girls. In fact, it's the first time that a girls team has ever won at that age level. Now, I said this is quite a group of girls. Two years ago, when they were 9 and 10 year olds, they also won the state championship. And they've proven in every season, whether it's soccer or indoor track or basketball, or softball that they're a team to be reckoned with, and I think the town is going to be saluting them for accomplishments for years to come if they all stick together and have the same attitude that they've had so far. In winning the district championship, they went through the tournament undefeated, which was not an easy task, and I'll just mention two games. They had to beat a strong Portland North team twice, and to do that, they had to score three runs in the bottom of the six, their last inning being three runs down to win those games. Um, they showed that they were a never-say-die group of girls, and uh, it wasn't over until it was over with these girls. In winning the state tournament up in Auburn, they beat a very strong Augusta East team, which had beaten them their first loss of the tournament the night before. They had to win that next game, and they did, scoring seven runs in the fourth inning to come from behind to win that game. They went down to Delaware and faced a different brand of competition from what they'd seen before, and went up against a very strong Maryland team, definitely one of the best teams in that tournament, and lost to them in the first game. But then they were determined to win a game in that tournament, and they played a very tough Rhode Island team and were ahead of them 5-1 to one going into the sixth inning. And unfortunately, Delaware rallied, excuse me, uh, Rhode Island rallied and won that game. But they can be very proud of what they accomplished on the field this year. And even more proud of what they accomplished on the field, I think they can be proud of what they did to get there. It took a lot of sacrifice. These girls dedicated themselves to winning a state championship this year, something that is easy to say but hard to do. And it took sacrifice to do it. While a lot of the girls in their classes were going to the beach and doing a lot of other things that 11 and 12 year old girls like to do in the summer, they were going to practice for a game almost every single day for the first seven weeks of their summer vacation, showing a lot of dedication in doing that. Some of them gave up possible chances to be on a travel soccer team. Others gave up summer camps of various kinds that they had been enrolled in. Um, sacrifices make 
worthy goals possible. And these girls showed that they had what, what it took to make the sacrifices to get the job done. But even beyond the victories that they won and the sacrifices that it took to, to win them, these girls in this town can be proud of the way they conducted themselves on and off the field. I've never been prouder to be associated with a group, more proud to be associated with a group than I have been to be with this group of girls and their families and their friends and their fans. They showed that it's possible to cheer for a team without cheering against the other team. There were no bickering about calls, there were no throwing bats, there were no disgusted looks at the umpires. This was a team that was positive in every sense of the way. And I think that in this age of uh, trash talking and in your face displays, these girls showed uh, a real true sense of sportsmanship that is not often seen these days. And this town, the district, and the state of Maine can be very proud to be represented by them. I know that I was proud, and I know that Ellen was proud, and I know that Mark was proud to be working with them. Cape Elizabeth Town Council Resolution, Girls 11 and 12, State of Maine, Little League Champions, 1997. Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Girls 11 and 12 recently won the Maine State Softball Championship and whereas many of the girls on this team also were state champions in 1995 and whereas attainment of the state crown is indicative of, a, of dedication to practice, good athletic skills, and an aspiration for continued achievement and whereas the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and all the citizens of Cape Elizabeth wish to express our pride in the Cape Elizabeth Girls Little League team for earning this distinction. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Cape Elizabeth Town Council that we hereby congratulate and honor the Girls Little League team on their first place finish, and we thank them for representing Cape Elizabeth so well. Dated this 11th day of August in the year 1997 at Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and signed by every member of the town council. Congratulations, girls. It was great. Moving right along. Review and action upon previous minutes. Move approval. Is there a second? Yeah. Councilor Jordan, is that, <coughs> did you give a second? I give a second. Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe on the fourth page there's just an inadvertent couple of words left out there. I think it says the Cape Elizabeth recesses. I think it should be the Cape Elizabeth Town Council recesses. I believe that was the, the way it was. But it's just an inadvertent. Uh, Can we, vote. by consensus, make that? Uh, yeah. Correction. With that correction, uh, there's now been a first and second. All in favor? Aye. Seven to zero. Yep. The next item is item 31, action upon Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendation to permit the Maine Department of Economic and Community Development to use Fort Williams Park for a QVC broadcast in September 1997. Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this item has been reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Uh, Betty Crane is here from that commission this evening. Uh, they unanimously recommended uh, its approval based on all the conditions uh, that were set last year and approved by the Town Council on, on this particular item. Uh, they, they ended up not doing it last year because of inclement weather, but uh, they are hoping that you'll give them permission to use it on September 21st. Are there any questions from any of the councilors? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, um, on the uh, conditions on the, on the back side of the paper, I, I didn't see any specific reference to liability insurance for the town. Uh, they may have liability insurance for QVC Local Inc., but I think that the town itself also uh, should add a condition of liability. So if somebody gets hurt over there, then we want to uh, have the town protected, I think. So uh, that perhaps would be an appropriate condition to uh, impose on QVC Local Inc. as part of the uh, situation. 
Uh, the town manager has uh, taken note of that, and uh, does any councillor have an objection to uh, that being added as a condition? I, I'm just wondering what the other conditions were it, that were approved last year. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't know what they were and how they were addressed. Yeah, the, the other conditions primarily are that, it is, uh, Mr. Berry suggested, uh, that there be a certificate of insurance listed in the town as a named insured, that they uh, pay for all of the town's expenses in conjunction with the activity, and that they make a $1,000 contribution to the Fort Williams Park Trust. I note that one of the items in their proposal says that uh, the QVC requests that any potential site rental or site fees rental, uh, FCCS uh, rental fees be waived in exchange for promotional value. Uh, I, I wonder if it isn't appropriate to have them uh, contribute. They're, they're, the thousand dollars is to uh, take care of that. Uh, we're, not, we're not waiving anything. They requested that both last year and this year on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, said nice request, but uh, we, we do expect you to pay for the... Oh, so the answer is no. They've said no, yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you. Any other comments? Is there a motion? I, um, are, are they providing porta potties for a thousand people and refuge disposal? Yeah, all of that. Paying for all of that sort of thing. I, I just, um, I have some objection to this particular proposal, um, primarily because I don't think that it fits the policy that we have established for the use of uh, Fort Williams. Um, the, the uses of it are for recreational and cultural uses. Uh, this appears to me to be a commercial use. <coughs> and. I think that specifically says that we should reject that sort of use of, of the park. Um, I don't think that it's in keeping with the recreational and cultural desires. That's one of the criteria that it needs to have. I don't think it's compatible with the enjoyment of the park by others because I think they have, they're proposing to have three big vans there and a thousand people and, and it seems that, and, and parking, and I don't think people will be able to enjoy the Portland Headlight area. Um, again, it's commercial in nature and it, they plan, I assume, to uh, advise the public and, and invite the public to come. And that's one of the reasons that uh, proposals are supposed to be turned down. So of seven, reasons for not using the fort, they seem to fall into four of them, not just one of them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to vote against the proposal. Let me ask, is there a motion? I'll make the motion. Um, second. But we might as well frame the motion for the public okay. at this point in time. Um, I make the uh, recommendation that we authorize the fort, as recommended by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, a permitted use for the Maine Department of Economic Community Development to use Fort Williams for a QVC broadcast on September 21st, 1997, with the conditions as previously stated. Councilor Jordan. Councilor Jordan seconds. Is there any further discussion? Councilor McGinty. I have a question for the town manager. This was done last year, is that correct? It was approved last year, and they were they were just about ready to go. And uh, I don't remember if it was a it was a hurricane. They got rained out. Got rained out, basically. Uh, is this setting, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, is this setting a precedent for commercial uh, activity that would not be in keeping with the either cultural or recreational uh, uh, statement policy statement requirements here? I, I'm just don't, don't want to set a precedent that will not be in keeping with the policy statement for the fort. Well, my personal view is no, if they're serving on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, and uh, uh, there are a myriad of activities that are reviewed by the Commission. Right. Um, we have somebody from the Commission here, if in fact you'd like that further, that further address, but uh, uh, that's up to you, Councilor. No, that's, uh, 
I, I certainly be happy to hear what the councillor Reed. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would be more concerned about setting a precedent about not approving a recommendation from an advisory commission. Sure. Um, also, I believe if Councillor um, Fritz has some concerns about the use of Fort Williams, I personally would love to have a full review of the Fort Williams policies, as I have several ideas that I'd like discussed on the issue. But for purposes of this discussion and with unanimous uh, a recommendation of support from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, unanimously I suggest the Town Council uh, consider that input. Just trying to make sure everybody gets to go once before we go twice. Councillor? Uh, no, I, I just want to say is I voted for it before and I'll vote for it again, but I don't think it fits the policy of the fort. I think we've been in the line, and I think that should be reviewed and take in some of these functions that will come at a later date. There'll be changes. And I think Carol has brought up a good point of what the policy says. Thank you. Councilor Fitz. If, if I could just say, within the recommendation, within the policy statement that the council has, it says the recommendations of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee shall be forwarded to the Cape Elizabeth Council, which may make independent findings in approving or denying any requests. Well, I don't think there's any question that we are the final uh, mm. group that decides, and it's simply an advisory body. I don't think that's. I don't think anybody was suggesting anything else. Councilor McGinty. Uh, I agree with Council Reed. I trust trust the judgment of the advisory committee on this. I'm sure that they at least thought about all these things and perhaps had discussion on it and came to a unanimous conclusion. And I'll support the decision on this. Is there any other discussion? Could I could I just ask whether um, the chair could comment on of uh, the Fort Williams advisory committee could comment on how what the discussion was in terms of commercial uses. I'm just, I certainly was not at this particular discussion for uh, this year for this group. Uh, now, obviously, uh, over the years, that issue has come up. Uh, the commercial use of the park uh, has come up on numerous occasions, uh, all the way from an auto show to uh, various activities, and it's always been broadly interpreted. Uh, that things of interest, uh, for example, the circus is going to be there, uh, and that was approved uh, as, as a fundraiser. That's so a I, town activity, though. Well, but you didn't, you asked about commercial, you didn't distinguish between, uh, you know, this and something else. So I think uh, uh, there always has been a general discussion. I am with Councillor Reed in that. Uh, uh, I think this year it will be appropriate to look at some of the policies uh, of the fort in a broad sense, and I uh, hope that when we have our discussion at council goals that we all remember that discussion. Are there any other uh, comments by any councillor? Hearing none, uh, all in favor? Six opposed? One. Motion carries six to one. Um, item 32. Action upon Fort Williams Advisory Commission recommendation to use Fort Williams Park for the terminus of a road race from Crescent Beach State Park in August 1998. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, act actually, this proposed road race would begin near the intersection of Charles Jordan Road, excuse me, Fowler Road and Route 77, the Fowler Road section down near the Sprague Hall within one-tenth of a mile of that. Uh, Joan Benoit Samuelson is here as well as Jim Toulouse and one other gentleman whose name escapes me from the main track club uh, to answer any questions <coughs> you may have on this. It was reviewed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission with their focus particularly the use within the park as, as opposed to the uh, the, the, the whole uh, route itself. Uh, we have had uh, one, one or two meetings, at least one meeting, uh, with representatives uh, of, of the uh, proposed road race. And uh, you know, they do seem to really know what they're doing in planning this. I think that the major issue is uh, the impact that it would have on Shore Road and, and traffic 
and uh, logis logistics of that. Uh, that is something we're aware of and something that we do need to work on. With, with that, what I, what I might do is defer uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Joan Benoit Samuelson, uh, who uh, I understand to be the chief spokesperson for this group. Well, we would be delighted to hear from <laughs> our guest. Thank you very much, members of the Town Council and Chairman Groff. It's particularly a pleasure for me to be here tonight as you awarded the Girls Little League team. I can remember sitting down at Family Field and Alliance Field, tucking my hair up under my baseball cap, just hoping that I could play because there were only seven members on a team. And because I was a girl, it didn't matter. I could, still couldn't play. So to see them come so far in this town over the years is just fantastic. So I think it's a real credit to all of you and the entire town. Um, Charlie Scribner is the other fellow who is with the main track club and also uh, is the president of road race management, which basically puts on road races from start to finish, soup to nuts, from the starting line logistics to the finishing line logistics. Jim Toulouse is also um, a member of the main track club and a resident of Cape Elizabeth. So um, please ask any questions you may have. It is our intent uh, to hold a road race that would run from uh, oh, about a tenth of a mile up from Fowler Road down Route 77 past the entrance to Crescent Beach then it would take a right hand turn on Shore Road and then a right hand uh, turn into the old main entrance of Fort Williams and head directly right down to the Portland headlight. It's a beautiful, beautiful course. It's very scenic and it's also a very fast time and that would make it very appealing to a lot of world ca class athletes who might be coming here to set a world's best uh, 10K time. I think uh, the town and the area and the course itself lends itself beautifully to a world class event like this and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the town and the whole area. Um, it would be the first time the state of Maine would ever put on a major road race. Um, most states do have major road races. Next, this weekend I'll be heading to the Falmouth Road Race on Cape Cod. It's the 25th anniversary of that race and we're hoping that if this race is approved by the town council um, we would either run the week before the Falmouth Road Race or the week after the Falmouth Road Race because a lot of the world-class athletes will be in the area for the race or races. Um, in Falmouth, the invited athletes or the elite athletes or the world-class athletes are usually guests of people in the town of Falmouth. We've been staying with a couple of different families over the 25 years of the Falmouth Road Race and it really becomes a town event and a town happening and something that the entire town looks forward to and they really roll out the red carpet for these people year after year and it's been a huge uh, economic boost for the, for the town of Falmouth. Are there any questions? Many of the councillors. Uh, uh, how many uh, would you expect to be in the race? Um, Councillor Barry, uh, we're saying for the first year, and we're hoping this will become an annual event, right. uh, between 2,500 and 3,000. Uh, two weeks ago, I ran in Davenport, Iowa, and there were 14,000 people in the race. Uh, there were 19,000 people signed up, but the heat index was 116 out there that day, so uh, <laughs> 5,000 of them dropped. Um, and uh, the Falmouth Road Race is usually about 5,000. But I think in fairness to everyone involved, we would limit the, the initial year entry to uh, 3,000. That's pretty exciting. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor McGinn. Um, I support the termination. I think what we're voting on tonight is the termination of this in Fort Williams Park, and I certainly support that and support the race itself. Um, my only concern was, and I mentioned this earlier to the town manager, is if we can mitigate the impact as much as we can on Shore Road, um, you know, in light of the residents who live along Shore Road. And I'm sure you'll be working with the police chief and the town manager and all the other uh, public people in town to hopefully mitigate that as much as possible. Yes, Councilor McGinty, we did have an earlier meeting, as uh, town manager McGovern said, um, and we did talk about the initial uh, problems or logistics that we might encounter in a race like this. It would definitely mean shutting down 77 for probably the first 15, 
20 minutes of the race, and it would probably mean closing Shore Road down for a longer period of time, maybe up to two hours. First of all, if you have world-class athletes running sub-five-minute miles for the whole entire distance of this race, they're going to be screaming down that road, and you don't want to even chance an incident with a vehicle except for emergency vehicles, naturally. Um, we would hope that we could open this race to town people who, townspeople who would want to walk the event and just be part of this historic and world-class event. Um, and that's the great thing about the sport of road racing. It's not like tennis where, you know, you or I would probably never have the opportunity to stand on center court and hit a tennis ball with world-class athletes. You can rub shoulders with these athletes and run in the same event with them. Um, so I would hate to see any mishap or incident take place because proper care was not taken to prevent traffic um, from running alongside these uh, runners. There, will, there would be press vehicles on the course. There may be a couple of motorcycles uh, following the lead male and the lead female in the race. Um, you would probably have one or two emergency vehicles parked along the course somewhere, uh, and you may have some cyclists on the course. Councilor Byer. Joan, will there also be a wheelchair event or not? I would like, Councilor Byer, I, that's a good question. Um, a lot of the events um, are open to wheelchairs. There are some events that close their races to wheelchairs because of safety. And I believe the Falmouth Road Race is closed to wheelchair athletes. I would hate for us to close it to wheelchair athletes. I think it's just a wonderful event, and they're very inspiring athletes. And the reason for that is that because it, the Falmouth Road Race comes out of Wood Hole, Woods Hole, climbs a huge hill over a graded bridge, and then dumps very quickly onto Shore, <laughs> ironically, Shore Road in Falmouth. And it's a very dangerous point. I don't foresee that being a problem here. Charlie, do you want to address that at all? Sure. Or the wheelchair athletes in an event like this? Uh, would I, could I ask if you're going to speak that you come to I'm the sorry. podium, please? We want all the uh, citizens to be able to see you in person. Very good. Thank you. I, I think the course that is planned, uh, the surface, uh, closing down Shore Road and different things would lend itself to the participation of handicapped or wheelchair athletes. Uh, a lot of courses take diversions onto gravel paths, et cetera, and, and they're concerned about the safety of the athletes. But this course, uh, being all good paved surface, uh, would not pose any problems uh, to, to a wheelchair athlete. I just want to make a comment on 77 and Shore Road, one of, uh, basically Shore Road about the closing down. One of the things that we've done for the main marathon and half marathon, which is running into Portland, Yarmouth, Cumberland, and, 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 uh, and Falmouth, and, and back to Portland, uh, the last two years, uh, the police departments of all the municipalities have asked us to put up caution signs uh, displayed along the route a week or two beforehand letting all the people know exactly the time the roads are going to be closed down and, and different things. And these are some of the things we probably uh, would try to do with, with the town's blessings uh, beforehand, door-to-door -door canvassing, et cetera, to let people exactly know when the time period uh, that the road would be closed down so we don't inconvenience uh, anybody. And, of course, uh, the emergency vehicles and things like that, of course, if there was a medical emergency, would be allowed to go through uh, to do what they have to do. But I think working with the town with signage, uh, traffic guards, and, and cones, vests, and, and all the things that we need to do, that we could make it a very safe route and, and a very good experience for everybody involved. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. It's nice to see a lot of old friends and friendly faces. Is there a motion? Councillor Reed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll move that um, we approve the terminus of the road race um, to be held in August with an alternate date that may be in September. 
um, as recommended by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Sir, I'll second. second. Councilor Jordan. Any further discussion? Uh, well, that's 1998. Right. Thank you. Yep. 1998. That's correct. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Seven to nothing. In favor. Uh, item 33. Action upon recommended charge for proposed Fort Williams Centennial Celebration Committee. Mr. McGovern. Yes, this was prepared with the assistance of the Appointments Committee Chairman, Rosemary Reed. And earlier you had agreed to establish this committee, but there wasn't a charge that was written for the committee. And this is the charge, and it, it is, uh, fits very well with the Appointments Committee recommended candidates. <laughs> Councilor Reed? I just have one suggestion. I'm sorry I didn't notice it until recently. Um, in the last um, sentence of the committee created, it should say, I believe, the remaining nine members shall be recommended by the Town Council Appointments Commission. I think we're to do. Yes. Since two will come from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Mm -hmm. So everybody understands that's the fourth sentence of on the first page, and nine instead of the remaining nine instead of oh, the remaining yeah, 11. Right, right. With that uh, modification, is there a motion? I so move. Second? I'll second. All in favor? Opposed? Seven, nothing. Item 34, action upon appointments committee recommendation for citizens to serve on the Fort Williams Centennial Celebration Committee. Councilor Reed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm very pleased to say that we've had nine members of the public um, express an interest in a work that will, in a uh, committee that will have a lot of work to do. And I was wondering if we could possibly read to the uh, public what the Centennial Celebration Committee charge is, since in the last item we approved it without reading it. Is that all right? That's fine, and why don't you, while you, uh, after you read that, uh, also then list for the public the, uh, uh, the recommendations of the uh, uh, Appointments Committee for this Fort Williams Centennial Anniversary Committee. Just what I was thinking. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the Fort Williams Centennial Celebration Committee uh, is created. Um, the committee shall consist of 11 citizens from the town of Cape Elizabeth. Two of the 11 shall be members of the current Fort Williams Advisory Commission and shall be appointed by the commission to serve. The remaining nine members shall be recommended by the Town Council Appointments Committee and shall be appointed by the Town Council. The committee shall choose a committee chair and secretary at their first meeting. They may uh, create other officers or subcommittees as they desire. Officers shall be members of the full committee. Subcommittee members need not be members of the full committee. The committee purpose uh, will be to plan a centennial celebration commemorating the 100th anniversary of the dedication of Fort Williams, which was originally dedicated in 1899. A celebration plan for 1999 shall be prepared during 1997 and 1998. An outline of the celebration plan shall be presented to the Town Council by October 1, 1998. The outline shall uh, also include a plan for financing any activities requiring funding. Those who have expressed an interest in serving are Jeffrey Barker, Alan Barthelman, Clinton Blood, Donald Evans, Sally Hinckley, Barbara Sanborn, Jeffrey Van Fleet, Richard Walker, and William Wadman. And I recommend that the Town Council approve those nine appointees, please. Second. And so the public understands uh, all these applicants have filled out applications and all the town councilors have been furnished with the applications of the various applicants. All in favor of uh, the, these individuals uh, being appointed to the committee in accord with the recommendation of the appointments committee. Seven, all opposed? Seven to zero, thank you. And I assume uh, 
these people will be notified expeditiously. Thank they will. You. Item 35, action upon recommendation to set a public hearing for September 8, 1997 on proposed actions regarding paper streets. Mr. McGovern. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank Maureen O'Meara for her uh, mm. assistance on this project. Uh, the, the work product you have before you has come about as a result of many, many months of work with, with many interested parties and many different meetings. Uh, the proposals that are here, uh, Maureen and I have reviewed them, the most recent proposals, and we're in total concurrence uh, as to the recommendation. We have had a, a very strong bias in favor of extending paper streets rather than vacating them. The reason for that is once you vacate a paper street, you've lost your interest forever. But once you extend, even if people want to individually petition for an individual paper street to be abandoned or vacated, uh, they can still do that. So our bias very much was in, excuse me, in favor of extension. Uh, this does need to be done by September 29, 1997. As it now stands, the only ones that uh, we're, we're recommending to vacate are in the vicinity uh, or within uh, Delano Park and are within the vicinity of, St of Stevenson Street, which is off uh, Spurwink Avenue, uh, a couple of paper streets down in the back there. The remainder of them, for various reasons, as Maureen outlined in her memo, uh, are proposed to uh, be extended. Uh, those reasons primarily are because of issues involving title, issues involving driveways and, and issues as, as to what access would then be. A particular concern for maintaining areas where there are drainage easements or, or Portland Water District uh, lines. And uh, finally, and I think perhaps most importantly, is the issue of uh, conservation uh, trail corridors. Uh, as Maureen went wandering through Oakhurst uh, on more than one occasion on this, she discovered all these paths all, all through the entire neighborhood. Many of those paths were on these paper streets. And by extending those paper streets, it retains the rights of all of those people in that area to use those. So I would uh, encourage you to set a public hearing on this on September 8, 1997. And just so the public at large is aware, there was a prior public hearing on paper streets. Uh, the recommendation has now been changed uh, where there are very many, few, much fewer uh, streets that would be vacated uh, and for that reason since the recommendation uh, has been changed by staff uh, it would be appropriate to allow the public to have another opportunity to comment uh, prior to any vote by the council and since we are uh, in a position uh, where we must vote uh, by the end of September um, I believe that's how the date was set in such a short span for a public hearing. If, in fact, uh, any members of the public have questions, they can certainly call the town manager, but uh, as you now have heard, the current recommendation uh, does not uh, vacate many of the paper streets. Is there a motion? I move that the uh, uh, public hearing be set for September 8, 1997 on the proposed actions regarding paper streets in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Second? I'll second with the reference to 7.30 p.m. at the town hall. Is that acceptable? Certainly, yes. All in favor? Question? Oh, discussion. I, I just have to come from a point of ignorance on this. I'm curious, in the case where a town, the town vacates uh, was it the town property to begin with? And if not, whom does the property go to? Or is there a transference? I apologize for my ignorance, but I don't know much about paper streets. Well, I'll give you the layman's after sitting through the presentations before I'll give you the layman's view. And that to me was always one of the problems because if in fact the town vacates, uh, then the land would go to the abutters. Uh, and it could certainly be argued that what would happen is the land that was contiguous to another piece of property, uh, half, half the paper street would go both ways. 
Now, that gets to have some issues in some cases, and that's uh, another problem. That would mean, uh, theoretically also, that since a landowner would then be owning more land, mm -hmm. that there could be a tax adjustment. So there would be a lot, of, there's a lot of work in vacating, uh, vacating the street because it does change the boundaries, can change the boundaries of an individual land. But that would be, uh, from my layperson's understanding, having this presented before, uh, it would go half and half to the land abutting. Thank you. That helps me. And one follow-up question then. Uh, does it then follow that there is there any process, an ongoing process for the town wherein people might want to acquire the paper street if they were adjacent uh, and would negotiate with the town in some fashion to acquire it for some amount of uh, money, hopefully? Or does that not occur? Yeah, there's a state law, a state statute that govern, governs that procedure. Basically, what the state law uh, has, has as its foundation that everyone that's within that subdivision has, has, an, own, has an underlying ownership uh, in that paper street as well as the, t the, the town itself having a dedication. So therefore, when, when there is a, it needs to be a petition, and when there is a petition for abandonment of a paper street, uh, the town council reviews it. Notice needs to be sent to everyone in that subdivision. Yep. Uh, they have a, a right of challenge under the, the state statute that they can exercise. Uh, but th there's, there's no payment that occurs uh, because it's under, under that particular statute, the abandonment statute, it's recognized that everyone has a value in it. So, you know, the, the, the appeal mechanism in essence is for one of those people there to claim that they ought to get something for it. And usually, you know, the, the town's community's positions has been let them debate that and that the communities don't get involved in it. We have abandoned in the last 20 years maybe three paper streets as a result of that process. Thank you very much. Councilman Jordan. So what you're saying, everyone within that subdivision has an interest in that paper street? That's so, yes. so if it goes by the one down at the end, and the land is, is doesn't really divert to the landowner at that point. Where when, does it go? When it's abandoned, it goes to the abutters on either side. That's right. As a paper street, it's owned equally by everyone in that subdivision. And the town. It's got to be a street before it goes back to the owners, then. Not a paper street. That's what you're saying. No, as a paper street, once it's abandoned, you split it in two and it goes, or in three, depending on how many property owners, four, and it goes both ways. While it's still, while it's still a paper street, everybody has rights in it. The minute you abandon a paper street, then the abutters are the ones that end up with rights in it. So by vacating, by the town vacating, what the town, this was always my problem with the initial recommendation, by the town vacating, uh, what we're doing, in my view, was for nothing, basically, giving a bonanza to people whose land was contiguous uh, to the paper street and that we weren't and that we should think long and hard about it because then we're extinguishing the rights of everyone else that, that had that piece of land while it was still a paper street before it was abandoned. And that was always my issue with with uh, just willy-nilly abandoning uh, lots of our paper streets because for whatever reason and I thought we should take a more restrictive look at it and that appears to me uh, what has happened now and but obviously uh, the public should have a right to uh, express their views. Uh, you say that the, the town also has a right in the paper street otherwise it would be nothing to abandon. Right? That's right. right. Just I might add, the other major change since the council last dealt with this issue is that there was an amendment to the state statute. Uh, that amendment was sponsored by, by Jane Amaro, the, the, uh, the senator from South Portland and Cape Elizabeth, of Cape Elizabeth, representing South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and Scarborough. And uh, what that does is, what that particular amendment provided was prior to its adoption, a town would be forced to actually build the street uh, if, it had, if it decided to extend uh, our right in them. Uh, her amendment said 
that you were not required to build them. Instead, we could keep them for recreation, conservation purposes. And there were a couple other technical amendments as well. That, you know, is probably the most significant thing that, you know, any legislator has done directly for Cape Elizabeth during this session. Uh, uh, because, uh, and not to sound like a political endorsement, but that, that's a tremendous uh, contribution to the process is to enable these traditional paths in, in Oakhurst and other areas to be kept uh, without forcing the town to build roads, which is not the character that anyone wants. So are the, the parcels that, or the paper streets that are proposed to be abandoned, have they been requested to do so by the individuals? Yes. I mean, is that mainly how they got on the list? The ones in Delano Park? And the Stevens Avenue area. Yes, although Delano Park, we have heard from individuals within Delano Park. My recollection is we haven't received a resolution from the whole association. So people, the whole report could be seen in the library between now and the public hearing. And that's, that's yes. Right. The earlier report, as well as Maureen's, and, and my, rec my recommendation, uh, Maureen will be, if she wrote it, I signed it. Uh, we'll be sure that, uh, Maureen will be sure that it gets over the library tomorrow, so I'm going to be guesting. Because I think the, the maps are in the previous report, so that you can see. That's right. That's also available here at the planning office. At the planning office, yeah. Any other questions? Just, just if I, we'll have it at the library, but I really recommend people come in and talk to Maureen, since she can, it's difficult to follow your way through it, understand it. I believe we have a motion and a second, don't we? Yes. Are we to assume uh, Ms. Amira is not on vacation during the next four weeks? Uh, Correct. Thank you. She's here. Okay. I just. Hearing no further discussion, uh, all in favor? Opposed. Seven nothing, and the public hearing is set for September 8th, 1997 at 7.30, correct, here at Town Hall. <coughs> Item 36, action upon recommendation to approve job description of facilities manager position. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Yes, the Town Council discussed this during the budget process and during a workshop with the school board. There were a couple of minor amendments involving uh, the educational attainment of, of the individual uh, who, who might be hired for this mission, but the council never formally approved the job description. The council usually does formally approve job description, so I'm submitting this to you this evening for approval. Is there a motion? Councilor Reed. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, move that. We approve the job description that was approved during the workshop with the school board. Uh, and I did just have one question in the first line. Why, why don't we do this? Why don't we get a second? Excuse and me. Then, and a, a second to now discussion and Councillor Reed, go ahead. I, I just, could we start the sentence with this position is primarily uh, responsible for? It, it, we could, but th this format mirrors all of our other job descriptions. Okay. But there's no reason we, we couldn't. Okay. Well, I just, it just looked like we weren't talking about a position, but I'll approve it either way. Are there any, is there any other discussion? Uh, Councilman. I'm sorry, I, I haven't been with this since its inception, I understand. And so uh, I was just wondering uh, uh, why, um, we, the, about the need for a full-time uh, uh, facilities manager. Uh, I, I was not part of the council when this was going on, I understand. I'm, I'm sure this may have been thrashed out by the council before, but uh, just for my information, uh, it, is this to be a full-time uh, facilities manager forever, or is this uh, something that could be done by uh, a consultant or manager uh, over a period of months to uh, make some uh, survey of every building that is owned by the town that is proposed to be uh, 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 managed by uh, this. And then once we have a uh, plan for all of the buildings and a schedule of maintenance and so forth in place, would it be possible for 
uh, the uh, actions to be done by a part-time person that would save the town some money? That's uh, just a question I have. I don't know. I'm sure this has been looked at. As I it said it certainly has been looked at, and it was done in the budget process. Right. Uh, and there was deep, extensive conversation and discussion concerning this particular new position, right. uh, along with consultation with the school board. If the town manager uh, would like to summarize those those, discuss, those discussions succinctly, uh, be my guess. <laughs> yes, uh, approximately three years ago, the townspeople of Cape Elizabeth faced a decision on whether or not to uh, to do some work on our school buildings, uh, which eventually resulted in almost a $12 million project. Uh, that followed a, a number of other uh, issues. Uh, one in particular was uh, the renovation of the upper floor of the middle school without any building permits. It involved the creation of a roof on one of the wings of the middle school without any building permits that wasn't structurally sound. And the, the combination of those things and the need to do the project, citizens began to ask, what's going on here? Uh, not only citizens, but council members and school board members. Who's in charge of uh, uh, the building permits that were not issued or watching it and so forth? It would, would have been the superintendent of schools at the time. Uh, the, that evolved into a, the, the discussion particularly among citizens and amongst the elected officials at the time the school was uh, voted upon that, you know, you've got to maintain these, these buildings now. You've got, to, you've got to do it right. We're not going to let these buildings fall behind again. Uh, you need to have a regular capital improvement plan, and you need to have someone really on touch of, of facilities uh, management uh, on top of it all. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, the town council uh, charged the building committee. This isn't probably as succinct as you want charged the building committee of uh, the middle, the elementary and middle school with recommending a plan for ongoing maintenance of, of middle schools. The town council also had a goal running for two years uh, that they wanted a, a plan for, for better facilities management. Uh, from that, there was a council goal subcommittee that met with us on this, and they recommended that the, that the way to do it was to have a facilities manager. There was a lot of debate on whether or not it ought to work for the town, work for the school. It was decided to work uh, for the town, since ultimately it's the town that's responsible for the buildings. We do have about $50 million worth of, of buildings that, that we're looking out after, ranging from Portland Headlight to the Spurring Church to uh, small sheds to the town hall to all of the school buildings. Uh, there are always projects that need doing. In, in all of the buildings. Uh, I get probably th at least five, six calls myself a day involving something involving a building. Uh, for that reason, uh, it was felt that this position ought to be created. Also envisioned that it would be a continuing position because of the, the need to oversee contractors uh, doing all sorts of projects, to be lining up projects. And you know, I'm confident that with, with someone being sure that all these projects are bid correctly, uh, and that, you know, in the things are done in a way that with good planning, when they're supposed to with savings, with combining certain types of projects, that in, in the long run, this project will save the town money instead of cost. But, you know, obviously, initially, there's an out-of-pocket expense, and this was reviewed by the council in its fi the finance committee back last spring, and my recollection is, is even though everyone wasn't unanimous on the final budget, I think the council at that point was unanimous in the finance committee on the need to create this position. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, there's a motion pending uh, to approve the recommendation, uh, to approve the job description of the facilities manager position. All in favor? Opposed? Seven to nothing. Item 37, action upon request to confirm the town manager's appointment of a facilities manager. Mr. McGovern. Yes, I'm very pleased to recommend Ernest W. McVeigh Jr. as our facilities manager. Uh, we had a number of applicants for this position, uh, over 50. We interviewed over six. Uh, it was the unanimous failing of the four members of the committee that uh, Mr. McVeigh uh, is the most qualified and, and the most fitting for what we see the needs in Cape Elizabeth. There had been some debate, I remember, you know, at the council level of whether or not you wanted someone that was really hands-on, that would, you know, do the plumbing, do, the, do all of that, 
versus someone who'd be very, very high level. And what, what I think we've found through Mr. McVeigh is a person that is the proper balance that will be doing some what I would call more hands-on stuff, but also looking at the bigger picture. When you look at his professional background, uh, he has uh, he is a master plumber. He, he very much understands all the plumbing and heating systems, which are which are major issues, uh, particularly within the school buildings. But otherwise, uh, he also has some experience with building construction, and uh, more particular. Uh, I think as everyone is aware, he's been the code enforcement officer uh, for the town, uh, responsible for the issuing of permits and of, of various types. So uh, I uh, strongly recommend uh, his confirmation to you. Is there a motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we confirm the appointment of Ernest W. McVeigh, Jr. to serve as facilities manager effective September 2nd, 1997. Second. Second. Councilman Jordan, discussion. I would, I would just like to say, and listen to the manager about being, and I believe he is a hands-on type deal. But in this job description, I don't see where I can read anybody to be hands-on as far as fixing the light bulb, or trying to uh, correct the problem with the door, what I mean with a lock or something to that effect. So. Uh, I think he is a hands-on type person, but he's not going to live forever. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all, all in favor uh, of the motion? It's a motion. Approved. Motion uh, to confirm the town manager's yeah. appointment of facilities manager. All in favor? Opposed? Six to one, with Councillor Barry voting to oppose. Item 38, action upon request for an abatement of property taxes, uh, $161.82 for fiscal year 1996, and $153.99 for fiscal year 1995 for five Rock Wall Lane. Mr. McGovern. Yes, on May 6, 1994, the uh, town assessor approved a reduction uh, in the, the valuation for this uh, property as a result of uh, meetings uh, with the property owners. Unfortunately, the, his letter of reduction uh, did not translate to our computer records. Uh, under state law, he's able to make a reduction for one year, and the town council is able to do it for the two previous years, and I would recommend that you grant the abatement. So moved. Second. All in favor? Seven to zero. Item 39, request from Paputic Club for Games of Chance on September 13th, 1997. Uh, I am, what am I doing? I'm accusing myself because I am a member of Paputic. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Well, OK. This, this item is a game of chance that uh, they typically do each year. Uh, they, they were willing, uh, Mr. DiOrio, to come this evening, uh, but due to the, the lateness of when it was placed on the agenda and the fact that uh, you know, there, there really wasn't any need for him to come, uh, we, we suggested they might not. He had also had an illness recently that we, we felt uh, that he'd probably better to stay home. So uh, I would encourage you to uh, approve this application to be submitted to the state of Maine. If there's um, going to be, I'm sorry, uh, Councilor Jordan, why don't you, for this little section, uh, be the chair? Thank you. <laughs> you raise your hand, everybody in favor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, would like to entertain a motion then on this item. Go ahead, Council McGinney. I move uh, approval of the application. Second. We have a second. Any other comment, questions? Yeah, what is the game of chance? I think it's chance and gambling, I guess. No, no, no. What, <laughs> what specific game of chance? It says Bino Bingo or a game of chance. I'd like to know what they propose to do. I'll have to refer to the manager. They, they typically have what, what they call a, a night where it's a fundraiser. They have roulette, roulette wheels. And oh, all right. Odds and ends. It's totally governed by the Department of uh, Public Safety. Oh, like Las Vegas have, night. Things like a chug-a-log. They used to have a list of them. 
the names of the right. guys, but they're not required to do that anymore. Well, I just wanted what they're going to do over there, that's all. <laughs> I hope you have a good time. <laughs> Thank you. No dancing, girls. Yes. No. Anybody else got a comment? Call for the motion. All in favor? Those opposed? Vote six in favor. Thank you. One abstention. Oh, excuse me, yeah. Thank you, uh, Council Majority. Uh, citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. Uh, Empty room. I, I had one quick item uh, that I should have mentioned earlier. Uh, about a, two months ago, the Town Council approved uh, the Cliff Park proposal for Fort Williams Park, and it was indicated that a, a, a donor was donating $25,000. Uh, the donor has, has been anonymous, but I think everyone's probably aware that it's Augustus Barber, a, a resident of Cape Elizabeth, and he, he now has no objection to his uh, name being known. He uh, called me this morning, and uh, he asked me again, what was the cost estimate for the whole project? And, I indicated $52,000, and he indicated that he now plans to donate the entire amount uh, for the cliff walk. And uh, that is the, I think, the largest single cash donation the town has ever received uh, for any project. So uh, we have received you know, land donations before, but uh, it's very, very significant. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be meeting with him uh, along with representatives of Fort Williams Commission and Tom Emery on Friday over the plans one last time, but uh, certainly very generous, and uh, we will be looking for some way to, to publicly recognize uh, uh, Mr. Barber as well. And on your behalf, in the interim, I today signed a letter uh, to send to Mr. Barber thanking him on behalf of the Town Council, and of course, we'll have some other recognition at some other time. That's very nice. Councilor George. Good. Where are we at with the sign deal as far as that walk goes? About a week ago, I received uh, from Tom Emery a proposed design for a sign. It's going to be taken up at the next meeting of the Ford Committee and then come back to the Council. It shows it, it's on a boulder, a rock, and one small plaque, you know, a little bit bigger than this, on, on the boulder that, that has the handicap rules, and then a, a second plaque right next to it that, that recognizes the contribution. But it would be on a rock, and it would be set back somewhat so that it's not, you know, to try to address some of the concerns expressed by the council that evening. It, the condition of the town council was that you do need to approve, have final approval on that. I just got an outline of it this past week and uh, we're going to the board committee first. That's all required is one sign for that walk? Well, uh, could I suggest that since it hasn't gone back to the fourth committee yet, we're not positive what's going to come out of the fourth committee but when that does, by our requirement, it has to come back to us. So I assume we're going to be addressing that next meeting. For the no, it would be when? the meeting after that because they're not meeting in August. Uh -huh. So we will see. I, I just right. didn't want to get cast in stone, but it's almost in the stone now by the sound. So <laughs> I don't know what I've lost already. I just. Um, I think there was. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it the next day. I believe that uh, ends our public agenda items. Unless there is there another any other discussion of items not on the agenda? Hearing none. Um, Chairman, I move that we go into executive session to uh, discuss the uh, the items uh, concerning land acquisition and the police benevolent association. The collective bargaining with the police? Yes. Yes. Is there a second to that motion? So moved. All in favor? Seven to nothing. Uh, it is not anticipated that when we do come back into session, we will do anything but adjourn. Uh, so with that, I would say good night.